Hello ladies, my name is Jill Tanner and I'm acting as the Interim Women's Ministry Director here at Grace Chapel. Our goal is to encourage all of the women who attend Grace Chapel to love the Lord God with all our soul, our mind, and strength, to do justice, to love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. If you've not been able to be a part of WOW before, we would love for you to come and join us for prayer, worship, teaching, discussion, and fellowship on Wednesday mornings at 9 or Wednesday evenings at 7 in the Worship Center. Our hope this fall is to provide relevant strategies to help you find peace and overcome anxiety in a world of worry. Join us as our team of teachers reveal portraits of biblical characters who dealt with anxiety, fear, or worry. We'll also dive into a companion book titled Calm My Anxious Heart, written by Linda Dillo. If you are unable to participate in person, you can download the study from this website and watch the teaching online. I'm looking forward to meeting you and know that you'll be warmly welcomed. See you on Wednesday. Well, good morning. I don't know if you saw last week's study as fun or not. I did. <laughs> I'm glad that you came back. And if you're new, I'm glad that you're here with us. You're in for a ride. Don't you worry about a thing. <laughs> written, written and recorded by Stevie Wonder in 1974, re-recorded by lots of other people. Don't you worry about a thing. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Everybody's got a thing. These are the lyrics. Everybody's got a thing, but some don't know how to handle it. Are you singing it in your head? Always reaching out in vain, just taking the things not worth having. But don't you worry about a thing. Don't you worry about a thing, mama, because I'll be standing on the side when you check it out. So what's your thing? What thing do you worry about the most? If you worry, if what you worry or fear about is, is where your kingdom is, what is that kingdom? What do you think about in the wee hours of the morning when you are tossing and turning and not able to, to sleep? What's valuable enough to you to cause bewilderment? This chapter summary of the book Running Scared, and this is... Um, you don't have to get this, but this is information from it. This is the world of worry portion of our study. There is hope, and it doesn't come from within. Here's a great quote from the book. He says, Edward T. Welch, the author, says, Worry and fear reveal what is valuable to us. And what is valuable to us, in turn, reveals our kingdom allegiances. Welch then goes on to address worry and fear. And again, this is just a summary of, his, of, his, of two of his chapters. First is fear, where shame or embarrassment or even conviction says, I am wrong. Anger says, you are wrong. Fear says, I am in danger. But it also says, I am vulnerable. And being vulnerable is scary because there is fear of judgment. We also might hear fear say, I need and I might not get. There is a close connection between what we fear and what we think we need. Our fears might also say, that is valuable to me, I love it, and have put my trust in it. Meaning, our fears point to what we really care about, and losing what we care about can be really scary. Another fear that can often be heard is, but I could die. Someone I love could die. There is tremendous hope, ladies. God hears our fears. <clears throat> he has beautiful words of comfort for fearful people. The book of Psalms is replete with them. Welch says in his book, after you listen to your own heart and find fear, Listen to God. Another thing he says is when we are in the battle, we aren't really thinking about the fear. Keep in mind that anxiety about the future is usually worse than the event itself. So the next chapter is about worry. He addresses worriers. Worriers live in the future. 
Quoting, quoting Welch, and I think it's up on the screen, fear can be triggered by the past, it can react to crises in the present, or anticipate them in the future. Its preferred time zone, however, is the future. We don't really worry about the past, do we, until it, come, until it becomes today's business. A better label for that might be regret or guilt. Worriers see the future in minute and gory detail, he says. Worriers are visionaries minus the optimism. The worriers leaps, the worrier leaps from past to future and back again, never landing in the present. Worriers are also false prophets. Most of us know that an Old Testament prophet lost his good standing if he goofed up just once. If the prophet made one mistake, he or she was for, forever banned from making prophecies. That's in Deuteronomy 18, 22. But you might say events that, can bring, uh, events that bring about worry can actually happen. True. But Welch says irrationality shows up in the worrier's success rate. They are always wrong, at least in the specifics. <laughs> Worriers think the worst about tomorrow, and it doesn't happen. When their prophecy doesn't come to pass, they don't change their intensity about their next worry. If an event does come to pass, it then justifies the worry they've experienced. And finally, about worrying, Welch says, there seems to be benefits, there seem to be benefits to worrying. That's why we do it. It lets us indulge in self-pity. And because we are naturally self-oriented, reflecting some self-centeredness, Worry puts the focus on ourselves. So those are the thoughts from running scared. When you have thoughts of worry or fear or anxiety, it is a battle in the mind. It's a battle for the heart that takes place in the mind. Fear and worry happen internally before there are outward signs of it. As believers, we have the Holy Spirit living within us, and he will guide and direct don't ignore his voice. He wants you to win this battle. So listen to 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 to 10. 2 Corinthians. But we have this treasure, which is Christ in us, if you look up to verse 6. In jars of clay, we have this treasure in jars of clay. We are the jars of clay, ladies. We're the usable, functional, maybe cracked pots. <laughs> <laughs> to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. It's our power. It's, it's not our power, but God's. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Crushed is the worst case scenario for those of you who go there. <laughs> Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Despair is the worst case scenario here. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. Ladies, that's for his glory. Constant communication with the Father, with Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, will get you through the fear, the worry, or the anxiety. Because he is in us, he will get us through it. Because he, in us, he, because he is in us, he will help you help someone else get through it. There are two biblical portraits that we're going to focus on today that you looked at over the past week. The first is in the Old Testament, and then we'll go to the New Testament. We'll look at how the Israelites processed their fear. Turn with me, if you'd like, to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus is the second book of the Bible in the Old Testament, so it's way back at the beginning. We have the benefit of knowing the faithfulness of God having read previous chapters of Exodus. We know what happened to the Israelites before, during, and after chapter 16. The Israelites, however, at chapter 16, only knew before chapter 16 experience. If they were listening and trusting in God, they would have seen the hope. So here's the background. They have supernaturally, miraculously, 
escaped from their brutal taskmasters in Egypt. God faithfully protected them from the plagues and moved every last one of them across the dry sea floor with walls of water held back on either side. Two million people, okay? Two million crossing across on dry land in the middle of an ocean. God drowns their pursuers. So here in chapter 16, protected, they're now moving as a city, a big city, in the wilderness. He has faithfully protected them. So Exodus chapter 16 says, from, They set out from Elim, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. Exodus 16, verses 2 and 3. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Ladies, that's a lot of complaints. (laughs) I get three or four and I'm discouraged. (laughs) Poor Moses and Aaron. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Do you hear their message? First, they grumble between each other against their leaders. They're saying, well, at least we had something to eat when we were in captivity in Egypt. They were talking used to be back in the day. And that's not the way we used to do it. They were focusing on the fact that then they had something to eat and forgot that it was God who had also provided for them while they were enslaved in Egypt. That was yesterday. Today, they're wandering around in the wilderness. They are discontented. They are uncomfortable. And right now, they are both hungry and angry, which equals hangry. (laughs) Clearly, they are not happy campers. Remember one of the messages of fear from Running Scared from Ed Welch's book, I need and I might not get. That's where they lived at that moment. The Israelites are literally in the middle of nowhere with no concession stands, no Costco, no restaurants, no gardens, and there is nothing to feed their hungry children. They are fearful. They are hungry and they are now angry. So the Israelites become fearful and did what scared people do. They complained, and they complained, and they grumbled. They accused Moses and Aaron of making the wrong decision, accusing them of not caring and blaming them for what they called poor leadership. They said, you brought us out here in the wilderness to kill us, this whole assembly with hunger. A bit dramatic, right? Isn't that inflammatory? Really, was Moses really, was his motivation to lead them into a place called nowhere, only to starve them? No, that was their dramatic accusation and premature conclusion. They were not looking back to the faithfulness of God and trusting that he would provide for his chosen people, by the way. So let's put this drama on pause and let me ask you, is that your first go-to, to complain, to blame and accuse the leadership that God has provided for you for such a time as this? Are you judging your leader's motives because you are fearful or scared? Are you fearful because the decisions that the, the decisions our political leaders are making, are you fearful because of the decisions our political leaders are making? Maybe so, but remember, God has put them in office and our trust is in him, not in our politicians. Our responsibility is to vote intelligently. How about your boss or your supervisor? Do you allege that he or she is biased against you? You got passed over for a promotion? Do you sense that you are more important than the supervisor that you have? Okay, for the married, maybe closer at home, how about your husband? Do you accuse or blame him for your present circumstances? My responsibility as a wife is to respect my husband and to love him, not to blame and complain and grumble and accuse. Well, I wish I could say that I've not complained, but I know I have, and I know I do. So too much meddling. Let me move on. One of the solutions to this kind of fear or worry is to remind ourselves that God has proven himself to be faithful. 
God had faithfully protected the Israelites from the enemy. They doubted and questioned their leader. Of course, he wasn't going to leave them in the desert to die of starvation. They were, as I said, his chosen people. So look at what God did. He showed up. Verse 10 of Exodus 16. The glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. And then... So since I couldn't find a photo of the Israelites harvesting manna, they didn't have cameras at that time. Here's an artful portrait. God saw their hangry hearts, and upon his word, he he supernaturally, again, miraculously, directed an unusually giant flock of quail to the campers. And everyone had meat to eat. Could you imagine? We're talking two million people. Could you imagine the quail and the feathers? Oh, my goodness. But they also were very excited because they finally had protein. But wait, there's more. The next morning, God displayed his mysterious manna all over the ground. The Bible says, in the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness, a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. There, There was no word for it. It was nothing anybody had ever seen before. It was, it was manna, which in Hebrew means, what is it? All they had to do was collect it. Moses, the man they had all complained about and grumbled against, tells these unhappy campers, the Israelites, God's instructions. He says, collect it daily, except for one day, collect for two days. That's so that they could honor the Sabbath. God provided what they needed each day and gave them extra instructions so that they would be able to honor his commandment to keep the Sabbath. And those who gathered more than enough and then kept to-go baskets, those are the manna hoarders, (laughs) they wound up with stinky and spoiled food, spoiled with maggots. God was serious. Mysterious manna. God gave them what they needed every single day for 40 years. And they would complain again, calling God's creative cuisine loathsome and worthless. Really? There's nothing to eat? Is that what your kids say? I remember my kids saying, there's nothing to eat. I don't like it. It's boring. Keith Green, I don't know if you remember him, he wrote a song, so I'm sure that those of you who know Keith Green have that song rumbling in your head. They ate manna waffles, manna burgers, manna cotti, manna (laughs) manna bananas, I don't know, manna everything. Um, They had God's miraculous manna specially made for them. They didn't consider it food at that point. No, they became grumblers again, complaining and fearful and ungrateful against God. The solution to fear here is to trust in a faithful God. They feared starvation when they should have feared the Lord. Trust lived out again and again overcomes fear. And we'll find that God is still faithful and he will provide according to the need every day, even if it is after the last minute. And isn't it usually in the last minute that we complain or question God's timing. The Israelites trusted in God who provided for them day by day, and 40 years later, he was still providing. What do we learn from this biblical portrait of the unhappy campers? Look to the past for God's faithfulness. Look to the present for his provision and to the future for his promises. Let me say that again. Look to the past for God's faithfulness to the present for his provision, and to the future for his promises. Trust, we also learn that trust is the muscle that reduces fear. When we exercise trust, it reduces fear. Be thankful, third, be thankful for whatever is his provision. I'm sure you all remember the slogan campaign, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, let's look at another biblical portrait from the scriptures and see for ourselves what Jesus did. If you'd like to, you can turn with me to Mark 14. I'm not going to read the entire passage. In the New Testament, it's the second book of the New Testament. Jesus had just had this time with his disciples in the quiet, secluded upper room. 
that we now know as the Last Supper, where he also instituted communion. Then they closed their time with a hymn. Wouldn't you love to know what that hymn was? The scriptures say that the disciples then went with Jesus to Gethsemane. And as Jesus went to pray, Peter, James, and John went with him. Verse 33 of Mark 14 says, Jesus began to be greatly distressed. The word means alarmed and troubled. And that means extreme anguish. Pause. Have you ever felt distressed or troubled? Maybe your thoughts swirl about in your head or maybe you're so emotionally spent that you just, you are physically exhausted. And then when you lay down to take a nap, you can't sleep. I felt that way when my mother was passing. There was so much going on emotionally, I just physically was exhausted. I can't imagine the distress or trouble that Jesus felt. But the fact that he felt that way says Jesus was human. He knew what was expected of him. His thoughts were agony in his soul, not forced upon him, freely stated. Unpause. Speaking of the same situation in another of the Gospels, Matthew 26 says, Jesus said to them, to the disciples, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. This is despair speaking. And then in Luke 22, the book after Mark and Luke, uh, sorry, the book after Mark, Luke and the author of his Gospel of Luke was also a physician. So we'll find often in his writings physiological or physical references. Luke's record says in verse 40, and when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And when he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and let me say that again. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus respectfully appeals to his father. If you are willing, I'd like to not have to go through this. <laughs> but it's not about what I want. It's about what you want. And he said this three times. Pause. Pause. Have you ever been in circumstances where you don't want to go through something? You know it's coming, you're anticipating it, and you just don't want to go through it. You just want to be on the other side of it. The process of surgery comes to mind. I didn't enjoy the painful stick of the IV that the nurse is putting in my arm. I just wanted to wake up, be on the other side of surgery and recovery with my knee fixed. But I had to go through the prep, the surgery, the recovery, the physical therapy to get to the other side. It's a process. Jesus says here, I don't want to go through this, but I will because I trust you, Abba or Daddy. In the heat of your anguish or your anxiety or your fear or your moments of stress, do you say, God, not my will, but yours? I have to admit, I don't as much as I should. And you know why we don't? Because the anxiety and the stress and the worry look inward towards self. And that's the battle we always have. That's the temptation we fight with, self-centeredness. Jesus was in pure submission to God. He was content, meaning he was pleased or satisfied to do the will of the Father. He respectfully resigned himself to what he knew God would want in these words, not my will, but yours be done. His allegiance was to God's kingdom. Unpause. What else? Let's look at verse 40, 43 of Luke 22. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. Have you ever wondered why did Jesus need encouragement? Why did he need to be strengthened? Or what did that look like? An angel strengthening Jesus. What do you think that encouragement might have been? Well, it was an act of mercy. Do you realize that we too have a supernatural and miraculous comforter living within, if we're believers? The Holy Spirit, and he comforts and encourages us when we need it. Charles Spurgeon said of this record in the scriptures, 
that Jesus was exceedingly weak. Clear from the fact that an angel came from heaven to strengthen him, for the holy angels do nothing superfluous. If Jesus had not needed strengthening, an angel would not have come from heaven to strengthen him. Spurgeon continues, this incident, provide, this incident proves the reality of our Savior's manhood. Jesus shared the weakness of our humanity, not in spiritual weakness so as to become guilty of any sin, but in mental weakness so as to be capable of great depression of spirit, and in physical weakness so as to be exhausted to the last degree by terrible bloody sweat. Spurgeon paints this incredible picture of Jesus' extreme physical weakness, and perhaps you've felt this way at some point in your life, or experienced sitting at someone's bedside who is so visi visibly, physically weak. Listen to Spurgeon's description of Jesus' emotional anguish. It is something different from pain, for sharp pain evidences at least some measure of strength. But perhaps some of you know what it is to feel as if you were scarcely alive. You were so weak that you could hardly realize you were actually living. The blood flowed, if it flowed at all. But very slowly, in the canals of your veins, everything seemed stagnant to you. You were very faint. You almost wished that you could become unconscious. For the, uncon for the consciousness you had was extremely painful. You were so weak and sick, you seemed almost ready to die. Jesus' words, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death, prove that the shadow of impending dissolution hung darkly over his spirit, body, and soul. And now at Gethsemane, the, power of the, the hour of powers of darkness when the devil was loose and doing his utmost against Christ, an angel came to strengthen him. Wow. And he needed angelic strength. And then what he did with what did he do with that strength? Verse 44 says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. The word in the Greek is agonia, agony, which is where we get that word. But it meant very heavy. One commentator said that there was a disturbance or distraction in Jesus' agony. Since the word means separation from people, men in distraction, or being separated from mankind. What a thought. Jesus was driven to the edge of distraction to the point of nearly going mad by the intensity of his agony. His agony caused him to pray more intently. I'm sorry, ladies, that's not what I do. <laughs> I wish I did more, more, and more. Garrett Scott Dawson writes, only Jesus' intentional embrace of the triune will as planned from eternity could move forward his redemption through his suffering. The impending or anticipatory grief was breaking his heart. What caused this agony that Jesus faced and this after the angel strengthened him? Here was Jesus' dilemma. On the one hand, we recognize that our eternity was valuable to him. At that moment, he cared for us, for you, for me. Garrett Scott Dawson goes on. Perhaps to, for Jesus, it felt like being pressed down with grief, like an olive under a millstone. To have the weight of the world on his back, knowing he will be crushed by it. To fear, despite earlier predictions otherwise, that he will never get up again. And knowing that if he does not rise, neither will the world. All will be in vain. All will be lost. All he wanted, all he prayed for, worked for, and yearned for will be gone. All the power he expended to heal will be for naught. All this world that he had tasted with such joy will become ashes in his mouth. Everyone, you and me, and everything he loves would be lost forever. Our eternity mattered to him. 
again, Garrett Scott Dawson. On the other hand, his fellowship with his father was also valuable. At that moment, he didn't want to be separated from his father. But worse, far worse, the presence he had always known is evaporating. The comforting assurance of his father's love in his heart, felt since youth, is being taken away. Jesus feels that he is becoming repugnant to his father. God, it seems, turns away his face. Such emptiness horrifies. The solid sense of everlasting arms underneath gives way to yawning abyss. Nothing awaits but endless darkness. He knew he must confront the unknown and would have to do it alone in the darkness of Calvary. He was going to experience a horror he hadn't known before. His father's face would be hidden because Jesus was suffering for our sins. The one who knew no sin was to be made sin for mankind. He knew it was coming. The prospect of this dreadful cup caused the struggle in the garden. And it happened as he knew it would. The hour was before him when he would cry out in wretchedness of soul, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Dr. Luke describes the physical effects of Jesus' struggle in suffering to accept the cup obediently and to do the Father's will. Luke 22, verse 44 says, Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. This is not a metaphor. It's a medical condition called hematohydrosis, which is rare, but documented, but a documented physical reaction to extreme stress. It is the bursting of the capillaries under the skin so that the blood comes through the pores and the skin becomes reddened. Jesus was in extreme psychological contradiction. His holy soul was being asked to accept as his own the full extent of human sin. He dealt with a physical condition in a spiritual manner. He willingly submitted himself to his father's will. What do we learn from this biblical portrait of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? We learn from his actions that he was human. Jesus was human. Agony and distress are human conditions that Jesus expressed in his humanity. We learn he had purpose. He had a higher purpose. Jesus acted with an eternal perspective. Jesus' relationship with his own father was valuable. He had an allegiance to God's kingdom. His purpose was out of this world, and trusting his father, he willingly submitted himself to his father's will. We also learn that he prayed prayer. God is personal. Jesus found comfort in communicating with his father. God cared about what his son was going through, and God cares about what you're going through. Let me leave you today with these thoughts to consider from both of these biblical portraits, the the unhappy campers and Jesus in the garden. Maybe we should turn our worry, the horizontal down here, things we worry about or the people we worry about that consumes our thinking. Turn that worry into worship. It's the vertical relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. Secondly, are you content within your heart? Do you have a peace that's separate from your circumstances? Do you exercise the muscle of trust? Or are you stuck on blowing fear out of proportion? Do you willingly submit yourself to the Father's will? Is he that personal to you? Jesus opted for trust when he submitted to his Father an act of worship. What do you find valuable? What is your kingdom allegiance? Are you snared by the stuff that is too close to the world? When you are in the middle of tension, of whatever the struggle is, fear, anxiety, or worry, Do you worry like the Israelites, or do you worship like Jesus did? Let me come back to my favorite Ed Welch quote of the day, repeating what we started with. Worry and fear reveal what is valuable to us, and what is valuable to us, in turn, reveals our kingdom allegiances. 
So what thing do you worry about? What's your thing? The thing that keeps you up at night, your fear, your anxiety, today or tomorrow, how will you choose to process it? Will you worry or will you worship? Let me pray. Oh God, thank you so much for um, just your love and your care for us and your, the way that you are so personal with each one of us, that you, that you really do care about our fears and our worries and anxieties. And you care more about how we process it. I pray that you would have your hand in the discussion, that you would put your fingerprints all over it. I thank you for the group leaders today who are going to be leading discussion. God, I just pray that you would work through them. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.